All right. Well, we're very, very delighted to have uh, Richard Freeman and Tenzing Bob Thurman and John Campbell here for the and, uh, fourth and time. And Mr. Bookman. And, and, and Mr. B. What, what is your first name? John. Name? John also? John Bookman is helping John Campbell. And, I mean, this is, this is as good as it gets here at Menla, and we really want to thank you for being here. And I hope you have a magical, transformative week, and we we'll seeing you all week. Thank you. Okay, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Where are you going? Thank you, Mike. That's Mike from Burbank. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, Mark Thurman. Mike calls me Tenzin. That was my nickname when I was a monkey many years ago. And so, I mean, it was my name, I real name then, but now it's a nickname since I'm an ex-monk. And uh, so I'm very happy Richard is back, Buddha and the yogis, and John is here, and I'm delighted seeing all of you. I can't believe all the happy faces. You're already happy, like. You don't even need to learn anything. <laughs> you look really, look at them, they're all smiling. they shiny faces. They're just yeah. totally happy. It's really nice. It's really good. And... Uh, you know, um, we are going to have a dialogue now, but first, since you're just here, how many of you are here previously to Buddha and the Yogis? How many of you are repeat offenders? <laughs> well, not so many. Okay. Not so many. But quite a few, maybe 20, 15%. And uh, then the others don't know that Menla means Medicine Buddha in Tibetan. It, uh, Sanskrit is Bhaisadya Guru, and the teacher of medicine, medicine or Medicine Buddha. And um, this mandala, this is Medicine Buddha, uh, and there's a whole story connected with it, which I won't launch into at length, but it's, um, there are eight Medicine Buddhas, and one of them is the Shakyamuni, same as the Shakyamuni Buddha, who 2,500 years ago, who is the Buddha of our era and of this planet, still, and he turned blue when he taught the medical teaching. By thinking about the sicknesses and sufferings of beings, he turned blue. <laughs> but... He, this blue was a radiant blue light that anything that light touched was healed. Anyone or any animal or human who were touched by that light or that blue light were healed by that blue light. So it's a very good blue light. It is said to be actually the light of ultimate reality, perfection, wisdom, which indicates somehow that, you know, in this basic underlying structure, energy structure of the universe or something like that, there is abundant energy of healing if people are not blocked from connecting to it through their ignorance, by their ignorance. But they connect to it through their wisdom, um, openness to it. And so that's why he turned blue, and then he created a thing. And so we have a um, sort of um, home, home, med a home meditation that we do, that everyone does when we come here, when we do a spiritual program of our own. And that's what we're going to do now for a minute. That's okay, we will, we will enter the mandala, Mentally of the Medicine Buddha, if you would kindly go into meditative mode, you all are totally ready to do so at the drop of a hat. So it's hardly a worry. And uh, you know, however you visualize or imagine sitting in meditative mode, John and Richard will not run around and correct your posture. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> not yet. <clears throat> so, uh, okay. So, so now, now the, what you do, what we do is you calm yourself down. And um, if we're doing this at length, which we're not tonight, just, just introducing the idea to create the environment of the whole week. And uh, because this is the Medicine Buddha environment. And um, so just first calm down. Then, and you know, usually we count to 10 or breaths or something like that to slow down the wandering mind, but you all look pretty concentrated. So what you then do is you turn your attention back into yourself and as if you're looking into your own face and into your own brain, your own body, your whole heart and back and whatever, however much of a body scan you want to do, looking for your real self and of course failing to land on anything solid. And when that happens, you feel a little disoriented, which is good. So you let that disorientation give you a little bit of a melting feeling and don't feel threatened by that you haven't come up with some sort of flag-waving identity right away. 
If you do, you're making a mistake. <laughs> and uh, so then, as we say in the, in, in the Buddha Dharma, let all become emptiness. Which just means freedom from intrinsically, really being any sort of form of anything that is non-illusory. So you sort of open up your mind to what actually you are, and you realize you're not quite sure, and what the world is around you, there, therefore you're not quite sure. So then, but you don't just think of it as a nothingness or just an empty space. You just are open to whatever it might be. And when you do that then, out of that pure potential that is emptiness, freedom, you imagine a giant jewel palace rising all around, not necessarily the building that you walked into, which has dissolved. Instead, a giant jewel palace, in the center of which sits the medicine Buddha, with a sort of body of pure light, like a jewel, like, like a luminous sapphire or translucent sort of piece of lapis, bright lapis, smiling at whatever size you want the mansion and him to be, the medicine Buddha. And it's a vast building, and in the building there's Ganesha, there's Brahma, there's Shiva, Vishnu, Skanda, whoever else you want, and Bhavani. Uma, of course, is there to make Shiva behave. And also many celestial bodhisattvas, Avalokiteshvara, Anjushri, Akasha Garma, like many, so many Maitreya. And then there are Rishi sages long-haired, wild Himalayan sages, Hindu sages, and there are mendicant monks and nuns, Buddhist monks and nuns, the four main assemblies, who are there to listen to the teaching of the Medicine Buddha on healing. And then around, uh, the walls of this giant palace are transparent, and it is luminous jewels. It's like jewels that are sort of like neon jewels. They're transparent, but they also glow with light. So you're just flooded in any kind of light, rainbows of light. And whatever your nature is, if you're a little bit on the cool side of nature, the reddish and yellowish lights are dominant and they are warming you. If you are hottish, then the cool blues and greens, purples are cooling you and you're just suffused with light. And you yourself are not your habitual, slightly weary embodiment. You are whatever you most need to be to be balanced and concentrated. And in a way, your, your body, can, you, you can imagine your body being pure light with certain sensitive channels within it, and, and lotuses and chakras and things, depending on what you know about that however you like, but basically you're made of light. And then outside the building, in the nature, everything that grows, every plant, every tree, every bush, every weed, every tick even, every deer, every bear, every dog, they're all healing energies, they're also all made of light. And they're growing there to balance anything negative, anything in your body or mind, a feeling of discomfort or unease, so that you just feel buoyed and alert and energized and ready to open to learn whatever you put your mind to, to experience whatever you focus on.
And this is the vision of Menla, of this hidden valley, what the Tibetans call a Beul, a secret hidden valley, like a Shangri-La valley. Actually, the concept of Shangri-La was based on that kind of idea. On earth, but in a specially protected, special healing place, with everything in your vision and in your imagination totally positive, and the opposite of what you might expect, of sort of some sort of suffering and so forth, that's only just a mistaken perception, any kind of carried over addiction or suffering or depression or whatever it may be. So that as long as you're at Menla, you have this open field and then you and then don't worry if you can't hold this visualization in your mind of this jewel mansion, jewel palace. Once you start to meditate by creating that setting for yourself and creating that sort of ideal embodiment for yourself, then you just sort of know it's there and it buoys you up. And you can leave it open the entire next six days, if you wish. Or each time you finish the meditation, you can sort of let everything melt back into you and then be your ordinary self in an ordinary place, as you prefer. Then again, when you meditate, open it up again. This is a special type of Indo-Tibetan creation of a positive setting, like your own mental temple or shrine setting when you meditate so that you don't just bring your ordinary habitual process into the meditation, you shift that to be open to new insight and experience and learning. Ding. Thank you. That's that's our medicine Buddha environment. <laughs> oh, okay. Why? Now I'll turn it over to you guys. Look, to a quick turn over. Yes, John. Can you explain why there are eight? Oh uh, yes, um, there were seven brothers in a universe maybe two billion big bangs and big crunches ago. Because the universe in the Indian cosmology is beginningless. There's no like worry about the first creation. How did it first happen? Why did God make it like this? And sort of whole monotheistic thing. Let's not worry about that. It, it never made it, actually. It doesn't exist, if you're really wise. It, it's just pure bliss. But if you want to think of it, it's a beginningless, infinite bunch of big bangs. So thousands and billions of Big Bangs ago, there were these seven brothers. And they were sons of a king, and then they somehow practiced, and they all became enlightened, and they became medicine Buddhas. The way they configured their Buddhahood, their vow as a Bodhisattva, is that when I'm a Buddha, I want to have a body that will radiate a healing light, and anything in my awareness and in my field, anyone who looks at me or anyone who thinks of me will feel healed right away. Otherwise, I don't want to be a Buddha. They make, they make like a vow like that, like a Bodhisattva vow. And these seven brothers did that. And then they've been extending their healing energy all over the universe. And then they looked forward in time, because in enlightened being, time, time is not a solid flow. And every moment of past, present, and future is equally available to the consciousness of an enlightened being, which is infinite in time as well as in space. And uh, they looked way forward and they found our universe, and our galaxy and our little dinky planet. Actually, although apparently Jackie Muni Buddha operated on a number of planets according to the Mahayana. But anyway, they saw this one and they said, oh, that Shaky Muni Buddha is a macho guy. Because he's going to go to the planet when living beings are in a dark age, Kali Yuga, when living beings are really lowly in their expectations. They don't really hope, expect a lot out of life. They just resign to like whatever. They only live maximum about a hundred years. And they get sick all the time and they're like freaking out about germs and bugs and whatever. <laughs> and so they're not going to be able to study Shakyamuni Buddha's teaching very well because they'll be sick all the time. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to go to that universe in that billions of billions of aeons and universes in the future, and we're going to merge with Shakyamuni Buddha, and we're going to like introduce the medicine Buddha teaching. So that they can heal them, so they can be healed enough to study and do their yoga practice. Otherwise, Shakyamuni Buddha's, in, you know, like avatar of being a Buddha will be for a waste, you know. So there's seven of them up behind them, Shakyamuni there, you see. It's sort of like a, it's what? a pet project. It's what? It's a pet project. Well, they wanted to help him out, you know. It's a little loud. And, um, and then there's a, this, these other deities, there's 50, 50 other deities, 51 other deities in this, in this um, painting, and they are in a mandala. They are, they are set around the mandala of the Medicine Buddha in his mansion, in a, a version of his mansion. And that, manda, that thing in that uh, little shrine thing there, which we really need to like upgrade, actually put a nice roof on it, make it nicer. But we'll get, we haven't had time. We only had 11 years working on it. But it's a powder mandala in there, which the monks make who visualize this, who have the expertise of visualizing this, and they make it with colored particles. And what they do is they're visualizing the giant, huge mansion all around when they do the ritual of making it. And then they mentally pull down, like into a blueprint, into a two-dimensional plane, the main lines and structures, what's called the Brahma line and this and that line, of the, of the mansion, of the three-dimensional mansion, holographic mansion that you visualize. And so it, this, it's like the seed of the vision is contained in that mandala over there. Usually they only, op they only create the mandala for the initiatory ritual, uh, and then sweep it up and offer it to the nagas in the stream, but uh, the particles. But they especially left this open for us, um, for the good omen for men, for men you know, because we're trying to realize that vision here. You know, the Tibet House is try is the Dalai Lama asked to us to found it to preserve the culture of Tibet, which is under ecocidal, genocidal, and culture-cidal pressure for silly political, geopolitical reasons, uh, but which will not succeed and it won't last, so don't worry, we're not worried or bitter, just it's an unfortunate thing. And so we were asked to support that culture, and uh, we have like a little museum and center in the city. But this place then was given to create a space to try to introduce the Tibetan medicine tradition in America, in a context of where we have what I, call, what I don't call modern medicine, but I call, I call it personally a little bit, a little bit uncivilly. I call it industrial medicine, <laughs> and it has really good points. If you break your legs, or if you get run over, or you get blown up by a hand grenade in Iraq in one of the many wars, to put you back together, they're really good about that. But they don't know whether you should eat spinach or broccoli, <laughs> and they really don't, and they don't tell you about it. So that's why they're, you know, problem. Whereas the Tibetan medicine does, although it's uh, like Ayurveda, you know, it, it addresses all of your life and your ethical life, which has to do with your health, you know, that etc., and your mental life, meditational life, your yoga life, just like Astanga does. Okay. Well, I don't want to talk. I want now your guys' turn. That was introduction. Oh, what to say? <laughs> I, well, I would, forget about the magic. We're just in it and say whatever you feel. Like. Oh, okay. Well, I, I was. Um, I, I like the the vision that the universe is going through um, big bangs and crunches. You know. Oh yes. And that that's a, a traditional, uh, not crunch, not big bangs and crunches, but inhales and exhales. Sure. Mm -hmm. And and this is a traditional vision, uh, you know, a, a Vedic vision. Of course. And uh, I think it's beautifully illustrated in the, the uh, legend of Vishnu doing yoga nidra, uh -huh. lying in the what's called the uh, causal ocean. And mm -hmm. Vishnu is blue. Mm -hmm. Sure, ultimate reality, some, perfection, wisdom. Yeah, and he's, as he falls into yoga nidra, uh, he starts to breathe through the pores of the skin, mm -hmm. and every time he um, and this is a point of, of confusion, because people always get prana and apana switched. Mm -hmm. 
which is natural. You know, does one mean inhaling, the other exhaling? So, um, I like the, the vision where when Vishnu is inhaling mm -hmm. from each pore of the skin, a little golden bubble appears. Uh -huh. So that's the expansive quality into manifestation. Mm -hmm. And each bubble is an entire universe. Mm -hmm. And so inside of each universe, then of course, who's there but Vishnu, who is uh -huh. pure <laughs> consciousness. Uh -huh. And Vishnu, um, because of this, uh, so there, there are gazillions of these little bubbles. Mm -hmm. And there's a little ocean of sweat that forms in each bubble. Mm -hmm. And Vishnu is in the center of each bubble, lying upon the Naga, mm -hmm. his friend Adi Shesha, who is mm -hmm. the king of Nagas. And uh, out of his navel, gets this big kind of pregnant belly and all of a sudden, and then out of his belly button pops a lotus flower. Uh -huh. It grows, and the lotus flower then gradually opens, and sitting in the middle of the lotus flower is Brahma. Uh -huh. um, and then Brahma is, of course, bewildered, and so he's then initiated into, with mantra, in order to wake up to find out who he is. So eventually he's... Confused, and he finally traces his seat because he's sitting. Uh, you know, it's like, and he finally figures out, you know, oh, he's coming out of the navel of Vishnu. <laughs> and and of course, there's a paradox here in that, in our experience, babies um, are what come out. You know, they're born out of an umbilical cord, and here it's switched, mm -hmm. and so, and. But it, you flip it in your mind that, you know, Vishnu is being realized in each universe as, mm -hmm. the, in a sense, the mother. Um, anyway, and then eventually, oh, I've gotten too far. It, this could, it can go on for... Well, that's ever. really good. But well, in each bubble, yeah. and so this is the yogic process of awakening. It's okay. the joining of these prana and apana to awaken samana vayu, which causes this growth out of your navel of a lotus flower. The equalizing with. Mm. Yeah, and then the birth there of the, uh, you know, the intelligence. And so you start to see the Brahma, who is more or less the uh, ego structure, but a divine ego structure, that yeah. then is the unfolding of, you know, the entire story of your life. <laughs> and uh, in a sense, we all live in separate universes that are all linked together. You know, not that separate, just slightly separate. <laughs> mm -hmm. From about here up, they're very separate. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever noticed that? Everybody's in their own world? Um, uh, yes. Their own mandala? Yet they're all, well, they think so. for better or for worse, yeah, kind of connected together. Especially mm -hmm. the, the down in the sewage area. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Biological area. So anyway, after some time, uh, it's just the core of Vishnu finally exhales. And this takes, I forget the numbers, but it's like... Um, Huge number, right? Oh, it's like gazillions, billions and billions and billions mm -hmm. and billions of years. And as he exhales, then the bubbles are gradually, they are deconstructed. The Brahma, each individual universe is enfolded back and back and back and back uh, in its hierarchical way. And finally the bubble is sucked back. And to Vishnu, he's just like snoozing, you know. It's just a breath cycle. And, uh, this, there's no beginning or end to it because mm -hmm. the... That's the, cool. That's really nice. The dissolution is the dissolution of time mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Into, it's beautiful. But I yeah. like the blue skin. The, huh? The, the blue skin. Mm -hmm. um, well, blue is the color of, uh, of the addiction of, you know, it's destructive. It's the it's the energy of destruction. Of hate. It's the it's the addiction of hatred, mm -hmm. transmuted into ultimate reality perfection. You know, because it t takes everything apart. You know, so that's why it's dark blue, or it's even almost like black blue. Yeah. But uh, uh, that's really a beautiful thing. The bubbles. Like you kind of feel it. Teeny little bubbles like 
silver box. So and I think it's become oh, I know what I'm going to say. I'm going to say the bang and crunch thing is just in terms of our current physics, you know. Oh, yeah. But the Indian physics puts language. Brahma, of course, is just the sound uh. You know, he's the vowel. He's associated with the vowel uh. And, the, and there's a, during the time of pralaya, when Vishnu has exhaled, right, and the bubbles have all gone, the Indian vision, the Vedic vision, which the Buddhists share, uh, is, and may have, there may be earlier Buddhas than Buddha, so the Vedas themselves touch back to another cycle of that. That's, there's no beginning in that sign as well. But anyway, it's not a, there's no vision of sort of like matter lying around in, after a big crunch, you know, and then exploding like in a big bang, you know, because that's the, that's the modern thing, the industrial thing about reductionism of everything as matter. But what it is, is it's consonants lying around inarticulated because there's no vowel, because the vowel was withdrawn when he exhaled, the vowels left. And so Brahma is, is the energy of language and vowels, and so when vowels come, then they sweep up the consonants, and they unite with the consonants, and then they make mantra, and then from mantra, all the individuated objects of different, you know, those many multiple different universes, of all those bubbles, of all those pores, that's really, <laughs> that's really beautiful. Actually, there's a, in the Vimalakirti, the Inconceivable Liberation, the Avatamsaka Sutra, they do talk about how Bodhisattva, the Inconceivable Liberation, can swallow hurricanes into the pores of their skin, you know, entirely, or entire oceans, you know, without, or even take, pick up universes and full play with them. So it's in that same plane there, I think, with, with Vishnu. And that's what they call the inconceivable liberation, but it's inconceivable, you know, luckily. Yeah, yeah language is considered the creative principle. Right. That everything Every is differentiated actually, world, yeah. Yeah, is language. And, uh, of course, fundamentalists um, think, well, that is their language that is the creative principle. You know? Right. So it could be, oh, it's Sanskrit, and everything is ultimately, that's the real language. Yes, if yes. You, if you go to Deva heaven, Vashyam. they'll be... Deva Vashyam. Yeah. Or, or maybe it's Hebrew, or... What? Hebrew, or... Well, yeah, other people, Hebrew, people think Hebrew, and yeah. other people think or Chinese. Or you die, or they think, you know... You, right. You, you go to but heaven, there must and be they a say, level. Salam alaikum. I was just thinking, I just wrote a thing about translation. Yeah. And of what they call an Avenika Dharma, a special, an exclusive property of a Buddha, mm. is that when a Buddha speaks to a crowd of people from many different countries, because Indian always was, everybody hears that in their own language, language. without any translation machine, without the Star Trek, you know, universal translators that they turn on, you know what I mean? When they meet one of those weird, like, troglodytes or somewhere. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and so that must mean that you, he, he is manifesting from the, underneath that, sort of in that same breathing level of Vishnu. Yeah. I like that breathing level. I really do. Through the pores. That solves the problem of no more coarse exhalation and inhalation. Breathing through the pores. Yeah. It's the Kumbhaka right. way. Yeah. That's, it's, that's nice. Because yeah. when you dissolve into the central channel, of course, you yoginis, then you, of course, one of the signs of dissolving your energy in the central channel is that you, you don't have coarse respiration. So it seems like you might be dead. But you don't have to worry because the energy comes in through the pores. The yogi can do that, they say. It's Kevala Kumbhaka. What? I think that's what uh, in the Ashtanga system they call Kevala Kumbhaka. Kevala Kumbhaka. That must be that the, right? the total mm-hmm. pot. Not that kind of pot. <laughs> right. Yeah, don't inhale through your pores. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go on time. Yeah. Okay. So please go on. You want now? Now you. We each time we have a root text, two root texts: one Buddha one and one one Vedic one, Vedist one. I call it. Actually, all I love all the six darshanas. All and I call them the Vedist yeah. people. And that's really the only difference, the Buddhist and the Vedas. Those are the two streams in India, yeah. Buddhist and Vedas. And nobody uses the term Vedist, well, but it the, would be the right term to use for all of them. Maybe too narrow, because there's so much of the what we call the Vedist tradition or the Sindhu tradition. 
Really? But don't they all say the Vedas are the holy writ to come from? No, not all, because really? the, the Agamas and the Tantras um, are the, it's kind of like they're right on the edge of the Veda. Everyone likes to claim the Veda these days. Because right. But Buddha did it. Buddha did it. No. Which he said they were like a little bit drunk, the people. <laughs> but they liked it. It's good poetry. But yeah. they don't claim it as as uh, but it's kind it, of like as as, as, as right. like a literalist, you know, like fundamentalist way. They were the anti-fundamentalists of those exactly. ancient times. But uh, there's so much in the Indian tradition that lies outside of the Veda that was adopted by the Vedic. Priests. Yes. And this is, you know, like all of the the early Shaiva teachings and things. Yeah. Probably not. Really, you know, they were indigenous groups, um, so there was a lot of mixing and mixing, and so, and you know, like today, like uh, the this this text we have here, the Bhavani Bhujangam, which supposedly was composed by Shankaracharya, who was ultimate Smarta Brahman, right? Veda, 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 but they didn't do this kind of teaching in the Vedas. This is a uh, this is Sri Vidya Tantra, that's what it is, which is kind of like a, an amalgamation of bouncing off the Veda, because the Vedas, right. they're the orthodox and they're the strict, and they're right. the ones with the class and the political power, and everybody wants to get in. Where is Shiva in the bubble with Brahma and Vishnu, by the way? He's in Vishnu's heart. Ah, good. It's the safest place to be, particularly if there's no... If what? Yeah. Particularly, if everything is dissolving, you want to get right in there. <laughs> so <laughs> he's uh, so so yeah. he's in in Vishnu's heart. So he's like what we call the the uh, gnosis hero. Yes. The the, the, the the large thing of of Vishnu would be what we call the commitment hero. Then mm -hmm. he's the gnosis hero. Then in his heart, there's like a mantra that is called the samadhi hero. Something like that, or drop, like yeah. a bindu. Yeah, bindu drop. So is there, a, there is a Shaiva meditation like that where they put them in the heart. Mm -hmm. And that's cool. The question is, where are you in this? Uh, but where is who? You. Who me? Yeah. I'm there with him. Yeah. Uh, although not really. I mean, with all these things like bubbles and like yeah, like it's pretty. Uh, but we're all there and yeah. everywhere. But you know, we're, we're unfortunately we're not really aware that we're there. Yeah. Enough. <laughs> unfortunately. And, and if Shiva's there, then Uma is there. Yes. And then without Uma, Shiva's like, forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> but I, then that's why I think... That's why Bhavani is important. I think yeah. his, uh, I, the Vedist, you know, made up word Vedist, I think that works nicely, though, because then it doesn't disallow for, you know, these whatever. The, it, it's, it's, a, it's a catch... All yeah, as a cat for, for um, yeah. Yeah. rather than Vedic, Vedic, Vedic. 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 Well, you know the, the, the yeah. Brahmin expression nastika, which people think means nihilist, doesn't mean the only reason it's it doesn't mean nihilist. It's not like a charvaka. The nastika, which is the thing leveled against the Buddhists and the Jains and uh, some others, means one who doesn't accept the divinity of the Vedas. That's what it means. It doesn't mean otherwise nihilist. It sounds like a nihilist, but it doesn't mean it means nihilistic about the about the divinity of the Vedas. Mm -hmm. So it's like those who don't think that the Bible, every every statement in the Bible is uh, is the, is the you know literalist, like those people who are in, having a drought in Texas. That guy who interviewed them went up and he said, "Well, well, do you think it might have something to do with climate change?" And the, the people said. Well, no, we don't see anything in the Bible about climate change, so we're not having climate change. <laughs> no. the cows are dying at their feet, you know, with the drought, you know, but it's no climate change. Okay, so, but my point is in the two rude things here, we have Bhavani and we have the Vajra Yogini. Mm -hmm. So we are actually attentive to the female wisdom in this coming yogic session. But the two rude texts we're using are, which is lucky, because... We guys are massively outnumbered. <laughs> Particularly in the yoga world. What? Yeah, in the yoga world. In the yoga world, the Buddhist world. In the modern oh, period. Yeah, in the modern Buddhist oh, world. Oh, definitely. Those monks are running around like looking seriously. Hey, Dalai Lama's ready to give in. He said in Italy, he said, I think I'm going to be female in my next life. He said, I'm going to reincarnate as a woman, he said. Because he said, I think women tend a little less to 
want to drop nuclear weapons on other people. They're a little less into it. Not totally less, but a little less. So that's necessary. And then he also, he, made, he really pleased the Italians because he then said, and in that life, I'll be so much more attractive. And he went, <laughs> he did. He actually made that just, he did. It's pretty cute as it is, but he said, oh, I'll be much more attractive. He did say it. It was in Italy, though. I don't know if he would say that in America. Maybe we don't deserve it. The Italians are so cool. <laughs> they appreciate fashion and so on. So that's what we do. We have in these two things which we will touch upon. And we each have like a, a few salutatory verses um, to, to riff on. And um, can you, can, you, you, like can you describe, uh, can you give a, a, any introduction to yeah, this, in, yeah. uh, where this <coughs> text, text comes from? Come, I, not oh. so historically, but just in its tradition, you say it's Sri Vidya Tantra. Tantra. Yeah. So this is. Um, so Shankaracharya is, um, by many people, consider him to be, you know, the, the great philosopher and the Vedanta of the Vedas side. Because right. he, yeah. Well, the, the Buddhists say the Buddhists say actually he was he became, he became Buddhist afterwards. Right. And actually the Hindus kicked him out, saying he was a crypto Buddhist. Prachabhauta. Prachabhauta. Yeah. Exactly. And, so uh, we do love him, actually. Yeah. And uh, anyway, he, he was in the 7th century? 8th century. 8th century. 8th century. Well, That's he had three say. lifetimes. Oh, Shankar. One after another, and from the Buddhist way of talking about it. Oh. He, had, he, was, he died young twice in a row. And then third one was where he wrote all his stuff. Oh. So he had three meals. There, there's answers. a lot of texts that are attributed to him. Right. Um, and well, I think he wrote them, but Western scholars don't think so. Well, yeah. Because they think every ancient person is just as stupid as them. Yeah, and they think, <laughs> how could he be such a hardcore, dry philosopher right. and write all this beautiful devotional poetry? Oh, fantastic. Just they, like Nag Nag Nagarjuna is his counterpart on the Buddhist side. Exactly. Yeah. Like Nagarjuna. <laughs> yes, Nagar. He Nagar. retained his aim with the help of the Nagas. <laughs> Anyway, for Ashtanga Yoga, Patabi Joyce is in the um, Shankaracharya lineage by mm -hmm. his family. Mm -hmm. So uh, Really? Patabi, you you know, mean blood lineage of Shankaracharya? Yes. Yeah. the family? Well, really? no. Well, you know, he's a smart Brahmin. And but right. Was, hmm? And so was Amma. Was Amma? Yeah, Amma so the both of them. Yeah, yeah and Amma, his wife, uh, his... Her family were the head priests at uh, the uh, Shiva temple in Nanjangut, oh, cool. which is 20 or about 40, 50 kilometers south of Mysore. It's the oldest existent Shiva temple in South India. Mm. And uh, she was cool. And uh, two of her brothers wrote Sanskrit uh, grammar texts. And uh, she knew everything. <laughs> and Patabi Joyce was taught Sanskrit at the University of Mysore, Sanskrit College, for 32 years. Mm. So he knew his, his stuff. And he would all, you know, when he, when he was doing Mysore class, he was always chanting, you know, the text of the day or the text of the week. And he was just chanting and then chanting. And when he'd come down to what, you know, what there's a, in the meter, there's always this, like, what they call a guru verse, when you put the pressure on the word, you know, mm -hmm. it's all part of the iambic pentameter. Mm -hmm. And he would squash people, you know, in rhythm to his <laughs> chants. <laughs> you know, so a lot of Indian classical music and rhythms came out of those Vedic chanting um, yes. patterns. And uh, anyway, he, what am I talking about? Uh, <laughs> being, uh, you know, being a Brahmin, he was very reserved about teaching non-Brahmins the good stuff. Right. Do you just practice and all is coming? Practice? <laughs> practice. And, and you had to more or less like catch him, twist his arm, which was very flexible because of all the yoga. And then he would, uh, and this actually he liked. It's like that's traditional in the Upanishads. You gotta like corner the teacher and like practically give them no out, but to tell you what you want to know. Um, and that's a very Hindu thing because they think, well, you know, you're not enlightened. It's, it's the Buddhist approach is very different. You know, we're going to be really nice to everybody. The Hindu approach is, you know, 
better luck next life. You know? <laughs> <laughs> a little, you know, it's a little bit like that. And, and of course all, you know, people who are developed in either tradition are, are very nice, you know, and very compassionate by nature, but that's just the, the teaching tradition. And so, um, he, so Patabi Joyce is actually an initiate in the Sri Vidya Tantra mm -hmm. tradition. He is a he did Shri, puja. That's Vaishnavite, right? right? Shri Vidya. Shri Vidya? Shri Vidya. It's Shri Vidya. Okay. Well, both, because Shankaracharya was also a secret Vaishnava. Mm. I see, okay. Who was actually a Vaishnava who was a secret. You know, he, he was very clever in that he, more or less, you know, the idea of the nesting doll. He would put each god or goddess and each tradition basically inside of one another as which drove right. people crazy because right. like, you know, well, we are the highest tradition. We have the most esoteric and the true teaching. And then he would agree, and he would buy, write verses <coughs> to a particular god, uh -huh. um, and then and saying, "Oh, that is the highest god." And you know, and like in this Bhavani Bhujangam, uh, Bhavani's lotus feet are being served by Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And so she's obviously, you know, their boss. Right. And she's much higher than they are. And then he would turn around and then he would write poetry to Shiva in which he was being, Shiva was being served by That's all the That's the beautiful other Indian thing. And then yes. they would turn around and yes. So each one became mm -hmm. the very center of the mandala. Right. And Shankaracharya, that was what really makes us smarter Brahman, a smarter Brahman, is that really all of these const constructs are right. really the same thing. Right. And it drives people... And people are denying. The Buddhists were in on that too. Exactly. Because the Buddhist. Um, the middle path is exactly. No, 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 I'm saying in a devotional way. Avalokiteshvara, in his Karanda Vyuha Sutra, you know, the Om Mani Peme Hum, you know, thousand arm. Mm -hmm. Oh, he has many, many forms. But anyway, they say he appears to Vish as Vishnu to those who want Vishnu. He appears as Shiva to those who want Shiva, etc. And Tara. You know, the 21 Taras, the 21,000 Taras, you know, they appear, whatever. You know, so the Buddhists had the thing where they could be Hindus, right? Then the Hindus, like they said, Buddha was Vishnu's ninth avatar, right? Although they came up with some kooky story about it because they were upset that they, they don't like the Vedas, you know, I mean, or they don't think the Vedas are... Well, absolute. it puts them out of some jobs. You know. What? It was an economic thing. Well, no, it's a, Buddhists were critical of the... Caste system. Scriptive caste yeah. system. Oh, yeah. Right. The, Brahm the Brahmins didn't like that because right. no, they didn't. they're kind of they on top like of the heap. Yeah. Well, they say they were, actually. Historically, the, it seems like the kings were the top of the heap, you know. And, yeah. the, and the Brahmins were like the professors, you know, the tenured professors. Yeah, and technically, saying they were, that on they top were more of the important. Kings, yeah, they, they said, according to them. Yeah, but the kings had the. The, the, the kings hired and fired them, I believe. Yeah. And gave the cows, you know, or took them away. Originally, there were only three castes. The, the, the Brahmins and Kshatriyas were a single caste. In, in the really? Pre, yeah, pre Kali Yuga. Oh, I didn't hear that. That's, that's Dharma Shastra's telling? <laughs> that's the same. Dharma Shastra's telling. Telling. <laughs> well, only three. Then it broke, broke apart because it was too much work to be king and priest at the same time. So then, um, right. so my, my question was. Uh, also, and then to follow up with that question, so if he was an initiate in the Sri Vidya tradition, uh, is then his Panchayatana Puja, is that a Sri Vidya mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a Shankaracharya Shaivite thing. Yeah, that's a Shaivite the, There are five main deities. The five main deities. That Shankaracharya wrote uh, long things about. And, uh, and they all interpenetrate beautifully. And so he was considered by uh, the people who belonged to each sect to be a, 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 a problem because basically he was showing the, ultimately he was, he was teaching the emptiness of their tradition, the relativity of their oh, tradition. Oh, Shankar, that's right, yeah. And, so they kicked him out and said he was a Buddhist. Yeah. <laughs> but he was a very good debater. And, yes. And so people would, the story is people would, Shankaracharya is coming to town and if, if you were a, a scholar, you would run, you would leave town. <laughs> because if you were de defeated in debate, you had to become the disciple of the person who out debated you, which is worse than modern academia, you know. <laughs> no, it's better. It's better yeah, it's actually modern. better because they... Actually, the, the Buddhist version <laughs> of that is that 
Dharmakirti was the one who, who Dharma, their, their guy, who champion was Dharmakirti. And actually, my name, the Dalai Lama, gave me his name because he said I should come here to America and reject all the Tirtikas. He said, <laughs> he did. But I was a monk. But then when I quit being a monk, he gave up on me. He realized I wasn't going to manage. But um, uh, they said Dharmakirti used to go to a town and he would put up his shingle and say, I'm here, who wants to debate? But then the Brahmins in South India at that time had a thing, if you lost the debate, you had to commit suicide. And he said he wouldn't accept that. that he, you know, he, it was much easier to commit suicide than it was to actually learn from the person who defeated you in the debate, and therefore he insisted on that. According to him, the Buddhists insisted on that. The Brahmins, being more fundamentalists, were into like, I'm going to hold my view to my death type of thing. You know what I mean? I'll die over my view. Yeah. Whereas the Buddhists say, that's stupid. You have, to, you have to learn something if you mistake, made a mistake. You know what I mean? They change it like that. Anyway, back to Bhavani. Oh, yeah. Back to Bhavani. So Shankaracharya um, wrote this. Well, uh, but the scholars probably think it was the Western a... scholars will say the pseudo Shankaracharya, right? Because the really strict yeah. ones, they like to say Tantra, somebody else did Tantra. They yeah. are so, so the, full of it. The, the theory is, is that because no single person could write this much stuff. Yeah. Um, that, and he was 8th century, that Tantra was really peaking 8th, 9th century in, well, in India. But according to, I don't agree with that. Yeah. That's, that's what the Western that's, scholars that's what the say. Western scholars say. Because you know why? Because they're so pathetic. <laughs> if, they, if, they even, if they even read one sentence, they want to publish it. Get on TV and you know, we get on the best television. list. <laughs> you know? So they can't imagine, which both I'm sure the Hindus say the same, and the Buddhists say that the the Tantra was revealed actually in Buddha's time, they say. And then it was the te the texts were available within the secret tradition from the time of Mahayana Sutras, about four hundred years after Buddha's time, from the time of Nakarjuna. And then there were no texts made available to any public of any kind for 700 years. They completely kept it secret. It was really, truly secret. So then you get to the 8th century-ish, you know, 7th, 6th, 7th, 8th century, and you see a, a text. So the Western people, because they cannot imagine someone would have a text with one verse in it, and they would publish it, so they could make money and be famous and get tenure and build a bunch of... Whatever. They can't imagine that people would actually keep it secret because it was sacred, yeah. It was so far out. Right? Just like they can't imagine that uh, that uh, do you know what I mean? That, that 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 there's such a thing as an enlightened person. They actually cannot. Uh, my first PhD dissertation defense at Columbia, because I was at an undergraduate school before that where we didn't have that. But the first one I did there, some poor guy was in his thesis on a Japanese Zen person, talked about how enlightened that person must have been. And he was really scolded and practically denied his PhD after all his student loans and everything by the other professors because they said, you can't talk about enlightenment. That's, we don't know about enlightenment. We just look at the, what look they at wrote there and like whether he peed in this part or that part or what. You know? <laughs> Evidence, you know, DNA samples from his dried <laughs> caca or something. We don't talk about enlightenment. You can't mention enlightenment. <laughs> it says, this is a Buddhist scholar. So I said, well, I think you can talk about it. <laughs> well, he, he, they may not have been enlightened, or you, you, you would suspect nobody was, I know. They're just trying to get power and fame. But, but we can talk about it. So I got the guy, that was Abe, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, they was done, throw him out. One alcoholic professor who was supposed to be in the East Asian. <laughs> He's like, you can't talk about enlightenment. I'm not going to read this thesis. He was like that. I had to reject him. Then they said, well, okay, if Bob Thurman wants you to, I guess. You know, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've been dealing with for 30 years. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't oh, mean to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, this is good context for people. Anyway, um, where are we? Um, <laughs> So it got him in trouble for representing the different, uh, a number of different yeah, the, divinities. Yeah, and, and so, and basically he's representing the uh, 
deeper yoga tradition or the deeper, the higher tantra tradition. Yes. In which you realize the middle path and yes. you realize the interpenetration of all the deities. Yes. And, you know, it's like, and you have the experience. You stop trying to escape into some psychotic nirvana. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Like everybody else did in the older days. Buddhists and Hindus both. Yeah. You know? The idea that there's this, that the goal is, what do anybody, does anybody think that the goal is near Vikalpa Samadhi? Be careful when you answer. That. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, the, 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 why this is important is, and why Bhavani is worshipped here and the Vajra Yogini here, is that, you know, a lot of people think, and they still do actually in the world, that Nirvana is a state outside the world. Just like what they call Nirvikapa Samadhi in, in the Hindu thing, or Turiya, you know, the fourth state, is a state outside the world. And so everything in the world sucks. <laughs> it's like suffering, it's controlled by avidya, it's like, right? And the, and the yoga, the yoga and Sankhya school of that, in the, the superficial yoga sutras, although my friend will disagree because he'll see a deeper meaning in it. But still, on the surface of it, it says, Chitta Vritti Nirodaha. So that's the same as Buddhist Nirvana. Niroda means cessation. So the great sages' analysis of the human psyche that suffers is that we're all psychotic. You realize that. <coughs> psychotic means that you think you are something that you're not. So you think you're some separate self that's like outside of you, that isn't you, right? And so you want to, and, and then you're a sensitive, you're a very sensitive being, you know, like soft fingertips, and you're worried about being bitten by a tick, <laughs> giving you a Lyme disease and some spirochete thing, what, what they call it? That's what they're called. <laughs> spirochete comes creeping, goes down your spine, and then goes and gets into your joints, tortures you. And so, so therefore, the idea that there's a place where there's no ticks is really super thrilling. <laughs> but actually, Tantra, Vedanta, Madhyamaka, they tell you, but they, they try to keep it a little quiet for, at first, because we're so sensitive. There's no escape at all. It's all interdependent and interrelated. Vishnu is going to keep on huffing and puffing. And we do are going to do that. So, so non-duality is what I'm talking about, right? There's no absolute outside of the relative. The absolute is the relative, right? That's non-duality. So, and apparently this is of course completely incredible to me. If you really know that, where there's, viscerally you have no sense of anything inside you that can escape from it all. Because that your essence is something apart from it all. If you really can lose that feeling, see through that, then apparently you really enjoy being into, totally interconnected with this huge glop of life. <laughs> That's kind of unbelievable. Like you enjoy being interconnected with the ticks. Because mm. the ticks are, all have little universes inside each little tick. With like the billion Vishnu's inside each tick cell. Right? Anyway, I'm sorry, that's a digression. Now, so back to the back to non-dual Shankara. Oh, yeah. And so Shankara Acharya, um, I can tell more history. His his guru was named Govinda. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Govinda's guru was named uh, Gaudapa. Gauda, yeah, Gaudapada, right? Yeah, Gaudapada wrote Gaudapada Karika, which was basically um, a reformulation using Vedic terms mm -hmm. of uh, Nagarjuna, mm -hmm. uh, Madhyamaka. Mm -hmm. And so. I love Gaudapada. So, um, and this was, so he was considered the founder of uh, Advaita, Advaita mm -hmm. Vedanta. Anyway, um, the, this particular school of Tantra uh, is probably the most, the most popular one in India. Uh, as you travel around, 
Um, but it's um, quite profound. Um, Is it the same? I wish I knew more about it. Sri Vidya and Shaiva Siddhanta are overlapping terms for the same thing, or? No, I think Shaiva Siddhanta is, uh, is a more narrow school. It's more kind of... Yeah. And like the Sri Vidya school spills Brahmi. off into other, other schools. So the Shankaracharya Sri Vidya school is different than a number of other Sri Vidya schools. The Vaishnava Sri Vidya, then there's the um, Kashmir Shaiva Sri Vidya. And, and basically, they're, I find them to be extremely similar. Yes. But they don't like each other. Yeah. Which is, that's just a kind of a human thing, you know. It seems because, to be. <laughs> and they'll have some, you know, little philosophic, you know, they, they evolved thousands of miles apart over hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, over this. But the Shri Vidya was, was, was northern. The Shri was southern. Yeah. And Shri Vidya was southern. Yeah. yeah. But then, you know, they, they travel and they mix. But, you well, know, yeah. as soon as you meet somebody who's as cool as you are, if your first reaction oh, yeah. is like, what an idiot, you know, they're wrong. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's, it really has gone on in India. It's not just, you know, our cultures that have this problem, but the, all these old traditional cultures have had that same problem. Sure. And it's quite well, eye-opening well, to experience. The human being, you know, yeah. an enlightened human being is psychotic. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's good. They have, they're frightened and they make problems. <laughs> And Bhavani is patient with them anyway. She's very nice anyway. Isn't it nice? Do you want to read a little of the beginning of Bhavani? Yeah. So, Bhujangam, as you know, you know Bhujangasana, it means cobra. And so this is a, a, a meter of, of 12 uh, syllables per line. That's the cobra meter, or the Bhujanga meter. <laughs> And uh, to do it correctly, it, you, you have to take many lifetimes as a uh, Paka Brahman to say this correctly. But the very last line is easy to chant. And it's the last line of the first verse. It's kind of, and the last line usually is one that... And these are memorized and people treat them as mantra. And so you, you sit around and you just sing this, these verses you know, for hours visualizing what they're saying. Come on, sing it. Come on. Okay. Shahadadara. You go ahead. I got a struggle. It sounds good. So, Dhamuatim mi deham rupam. So that's 12. Oh, what's that? That's the that's last. That's the final line. Pada. Oh, the final line. Oh, Sudamurti mide. Sudamurti mide ham ananda rupam. But you didn't do the first verse. Uh, no, I'm going to Shat adara pankajar han. Shat adara pankajar hanta viraja. Sushum nantarale tite jola santin. Sushum nantaram dravya yantin pibantin. Sushum nantaram your translation. Okay. Is it yours? Yeah, this I first extol- one. Is yeah, the first seven are my translation, and then the last I one. I love it. You're terrible. extolling. Yeah, that's ide. When you say ide, ide is to praise. I forgot that praise word entirely. Yeah. You didn't say I praise, you say I extol. That's brilliant. <laughs> I'm sorry. All the other translators say I that. I found that word in Boulder somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> we use it in Boulder all the time. What? We don't you talk, extol, you don't you praise extol. and yeah. screw around. You extol. You meet somebody on the street, I extol you. Ah! It's fabulous. <laughs> okay. I mean, we <laughs> kiss each other's feet, you know. I love well, it. It's, Come on, I extol. I extol Bhavani, uh, whose body is nectar and whose very form is joy. So, mm. Sutta, Sutta Murti is the name for uh, a, a physical idol or a deity. Right, well, that's the body. last line for yeah. you putting first, we so I get it. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I extol Bhavani, Sutta whose, whose, bo- whose actual body is yeah, nectar. Murti. Yeah. Sutta is, 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 is elixir, right? Yeah, and nectar. Nectar, yeah. yeah. So Sutta Murti. Ideham. Ide. Oh, Ide. That's Ide. It's extol. Ide. Aham. Ide. You know, the da sound and the la sound is the same in the Veda. It's actually, you know, that's that one thing I know from the Veda. 
Agnimile, it's an L. Agnimile Prohitam Vyajasya Deva Murtijam Purusharatnadatam. That's what I want to know. Anyway, that's Ide. That's wonderful. Okay, then? Oh, okay. And Aham. And so you got to realize that we're talking about your body. Yes. Her body is your body, by the way. Mm-hmm. It's okay. Oh. Don't think about that. Okay. <laughs> or the body. Okay, is made of nectar. So we're yes. just misperceiving the body. And nectar is compassion. That's its own oh. ingredient. It's karuna. Absolutely. Organic. Sutta Mortimi Deham. Ananda Rupam. So the form is ananda. The form. Uh, and that takes it's us to bliss. the heart sutra. You know, uh, rupam shunyata shunyata eva rupam. That form itself uh, is emptiness. It's not like... Yes. Emptiness or form illuminates emptiness. Or that. There's no duality. The right, right. form itself is this exquisiteness. Uh, it's, that's, it's, that's, it's hard to explain. That's the Kal Chakra. I mean, that is the, you know, they, they have this special thing called Tongsuk Shunya, you know, Shunya Rupa. Uh-huh. You know, void form. Same thing. Void as form. Yeah. That's wonderful. Ananda Rupa. David Kite insists on translating Ananda as ecstasy. No. <laughs> Joy is not enough for him. He says, Ananda. He's been to Burning Man a bunch of times. What? what? He's been to Burning Man a bunch of times. I know. Yeah. We're going this summer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then we get back to the, the thing. Okay. Uh, so, so that's the last line. I yeah, stole Bhavani. I, yeah. used to, I knew a wonderful woman named Bhavani. Actually, she introduced my wife and myself. Many years ago, she passed away since then. She was called Bhavani by Gayatri Devi. Remember her? Yeah. yeah. And Gayatri Devi gave her the name Bhavani. She was really a great, great woman. And what does it mean, Bhavani? Bhavani, Bhava means existence, right? Mm-hmm. Bhavani, uh, I guess it means that she's all existence or something. Yeah, she's all, she is. It also is, it's the earth, too. It, it also is the earth. Bhavani. Yeah. So the root is Bhu, to be. And they're just like, you can squeeze so many different meanings. It means becoming and being. Well, right. Uh, being so, is becoming, so becoming is it's being. Beautiful. It's so yeah. beautiful. It's, it's so loving. He, he loves her so much, adores her so much, that her body itself, he perceives, as made of nectar. Mm-hmm. It's not, not flesh and blood and like weird stuff. Yeah. It's, the body itself is nectar. Yeah. And it has a form that is pure ecstasy or joy. Yeah. And this is actually, this, mm-hmm. as we'll see, this is actually the form of your own subtle body, or your meditative mm-hmm. body. Okay. Which is the next... Uh, Shuddha so. mandalam dravayantim pivantim. Oh, you're going backwards. That's okay. Well, well we yeah, gotta which go, now we've got to go forward. He triumphantly shines Shat. out at the end. Oh, yeah. you, you're, Shat okay, adara pankajaruha. So, pankajaruha are lotus flowers. Shat um, adara is at the end of a stream or a string of lotus flowers, um, of six lotus flowers, you uh-huh. guess what those are. Uh, she uh, is, uh, at the anta, the end of it, she virajats, she shines. Virajat, yes. That's right, that, yeah, that's the same yeah. word as raja, king. A king yeah, is king. supposed to shine. Yeah. Right. And so, virajat. So that's at the end of the... Uh, at the end of the chain of six chakras. Oh, so the, yes. remember the crown chakra is not a chakra. Mm-hmm. In, uh, at the end of the six chakras. Yeah. So, but at either end, you can choose depending on your your sect. What? Either end of the chain. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it's at the end of a string of six lotuses. But does it, is it, does the end have to be either end, or can the end be? Withdrawn into the heart center. You can do right in the center of the heart. You so then other words, you're at the end. If you have the six because, like this, the end yeah, would be in the middle. Because right. each each chakra is multidimensional in that right. sense. That as you go to the core, you are approaching the enfolding of everything. Right. To a, to a seed or to right. A okay. Chakra. Great. So it's um, exceedingly lustrous in the middle way of the sushumna. Sushumna rale. Atite jola santi. Mm-hmm. Ati. Ati teja, right? Yeah. Teja is that energy, luster. Mm-hmm. And I don't know the jo, ola, ula santi. Yeah, ula is shiny. What? Shiny. Shining, yeah. Ula santi. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. 
lustrous, uh, yeah, exceeding the Sushumna. in the middle Antarali. way. Of the Antarali is in the middle, in, in, within, yeah, in the within center. the Sushumna, yeah. Of the Sushumna. Yeah. Sushumna is the Avaduti, we call the Buddhists call it the Avaduti. Yeah, the central channel. Yeah. The, the, right? You all know about the central channel? Plum line. Goes from here to the tip of the genital, up to the so crown, right. down through all. And you don't have to have six chakras, you can have nine, you can have five, you can yeah. have different numbers. You can have lots of, yeah. Right? Yeah. You can have lots of. there are six, you know, that are. Yeah, no, those are main point. six, yeah. yeah. And then down to the tip of the genital, the male or female. Right? That's the sushumna. Okay. Closed off in the unenlightened person, the ordinary person. Sudamur, sutta mandalam. He melts the mandala and nectar and drinks. So, sutta mandalam means the, the mandala of nectar. And that's a name for the moon. Uh huh. Okay, so the moon in the, the moon. Mm -hmm. And uh, the moon is actually the collecting cup of the thousand petal lotus. So it's up at the the talumula, the root of Pala, uh -huh. is the chandra of uh -huh. Sahasrara. Uh -huh. And this is where nectar accumulates. Oh, and, yes. Uh, so when she shines out, she melts the moon. So the moon starts to drip nectar. Drarayantin. And she drinks that nectar. Pivantin. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's how she becomes made of nectar. Yeah, so she made so when the yogi does that, does the yogi gets the tongue up there, blocks off the <laughs> dripping thing. <laughs> Very good. Then yeah. it just drips down. Mm, yeah. We covered that last time. Yeah, yeah we did. Yeah, post time is drip. Yeah. <laughs> That's another Avenica Dharma of a Buddha. Of a, of a, of a, <laughs> not, not all Buddhas, but the, what they call the Parama Nirmanakaya, the Supreme Emanation Body Buddha, is that the tongue can cover its entire face. It touches hairline. Yeah. That's the external. So it, you uh, really that's have a to test, have, yeah. Really have to. Is that one of the 32 signs? Take that life, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it one is. Of the yeah, long earlobes, mm -hmm. deep voice, deep nail. No, 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 that's not, it's not deep. deep Brahma, it's a Brahma, Brahma, uh, Brahma voice. Brahma oh. voice. Oh. It doesn't have to be deep. It could be, it could be a tenor. Okay. <laughs> a sweet voice. Yeah, okay. So, okay. beautiful. Yeah, so okay. that's basically the... Um, that's the salutation. And every th meaning in these great Indian genius writers, every meaning and everything to be understood in any treatise is always in the salutatory verse. Yeah. And so, so if you can understand the salutatory verse, you can understand it. Yeah, so that's why people usually, they learn the first verse, mm -hmm. and that's usually where they stop and then <laughs> because it's too hard to learn. <laughs> but you just can chant the first verse again and again as, you know, throughout the day, uh, like a pop song or something. It you know, gets stuck in your ear. And so, and the Bujanga meter is a little bit... It's a very emotional meter. It weaves around. Six, six feet with two beats in each foot. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, can I read a verse? Oh, yeah. But I'm not going to read the Tibetan, but... Uh, no, who's Rad, who is Vajra Yogini? Now, let me tell the story here. No, not Opa. Well, Vajra Yogini is, I call her, Ms. Buddha. Because she is the same as Chakrasambara Buddha, who is, has different forms, you know. And which in Chakrasambara there, Sambara means, it can mean both a vow and it can also mean the Shambara, the supreme Sham, you know, the supreme bliss, it can mean, which also means a vow, it can have a double meaning. And Chakra means a wheel. So I call Chakrasambara, I translate it as the super bliss machine Buddha. Because chakra is like a machine, right? But usually it's a male-female in union, you know. And then the Vajra Yogini is, can be the female, Vajra Varahi or Vajra Yogini can be the female. And uh, but there is a form where it's just a female, and the male is reduced to the staff that she carries, called the Katvanga, which is a staff with a freshly severed head, a dried head, and a skull, and then a Vajra on the top and a vase at the bottom, you know which symbolizes her control of the, her, his control of the central channel, the Sushumna channel. 
yeah, the carrying vows, the staff. The, the katanga. The... Katanga is like a Prakrit word. That, no, it's like a shaman staff. And uh, so she doesn't need a male. You know, she's so bright red in color. She wears a bone apron, otherwise naked. She wears a kind of bone like network of bone, human bone. She wears, and she has she has a skull bowl. She holds up in this one hand like this. And in the icons, I mean, she's like walks and talks and does things and whatever, but normally, but the, the icons, she's holding this and drinking the blood of, um, um, which, is, which, is, which is a kind of nectar, but it's the transmutation of the demons, you know, it's demon blood, but turned into nectar. And in this hand, she carries a flaying knife, which, which symbolizes hacking apart all matter, you know, all sort of like, Coarse matters, you know, to reveal the nectar, emptiness, ultimate, infinite, clear light energy at the, that the universe is constituted by. And the history is that Narapa, that, so this, that's an ancient form of, of, uh, of it's, she's the same really as Uma and Shiva, the two, you know, Chaka Samar. They, they are, there's a legend which pits them a little bit against the Rudra form of Shiva. But the Shiva form of Shiva is the same, I think, basically. You know, Rudra means rude, you know. Shiva That's means peaceful. <laughs> anyway, Narapa was, you know, a yogi, and he did a lot of, of meditation on this, and he had this, he was taught by someone called Tilopa, and uh, Tilipada or Tilopa. And before that, he was a great scholar. He was the president of the university, of the Nalanda University. And in those days, the president was the gatekeeper. You know, in the university, you have a policeman in a box outside and the door, like in case some untoward person tries to get on camp, and you know that? We have, like in Colombia, there's a guy in a little box. And uh, the president of the university in the ancient Buddhist Indian university was in the box. And then anybody who wanted to come to university to debate with the people, the deans and whoever it was, the scholars in the university, they would have to debate with that guy in the box first. That was the lead person in the thing, because if you beat anybody in the university's debate, you took over the university. You know, the mayor would come and award the presidency of the university to you if you could defeat everybody in the university. So the gatekeeper was, the, pre the president wasn't sitting back, you know, calling up some donor, donor and like running around <laughs> and creating a football field for them and like <laughs> farting around with them and being paid 20 times what the faculty's paid or a hundred times, like the ridiculous CEO cult we have now in America, including in the universities. There the university was in the police box out front, defending the university by having the philosophy of what it was all about. You know, but that's, so Narabha was like that, and then you know, you all know the story of Narabha? And he was reading a text, you know, he was in his room after work, and he was reading a text, and a, the cleaning lady came in, she was sweeping, and she said, oh, Sunny boy, what are you doing there? He says, uh, he says, I'm, I'm reading this book. She says, oh, you can read it? Yeah, I can read it. She said, uh, well, do you know what the words are? Yeah, I know what the words are. She says, do you know what the meaning is? She says, yeah, I know the meaning. She, says, oh, she started going boo-hoo, weeping and crying. She said, oh, she starts crying. This is like the cleaning lady who comes in late you know, in, the, in the office building. And she's weeping and sobbing and slobbering there in his office. And she, 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 she says, why are you crying? She says, well, because you're the, head, the lead scholar of the university and you're lying to me. You told me you know the meaning and you don't. <laughs> so he says, oh, well, I guess I don't. And so then she says, and he says, but who does? He then says. She says, oh, my brother does. And then he says, well, who's your brother? He said, oh, he's someone called Tilopa. You wouldn't even know about him. She says, well, where is he? She says, well, he's over on the Yamana, like, you know, in the jungle, like, you know, like, 200 miles from here, something like that. And she says, well, I want to go talk to him. And she said, well, you might be able to if you say 100,000 mantras of Om Sri Vata He He Ruru Kaan Hum Hum Pe Dage Ne Jala Shambharam Swaha. You say that 100,000 times, and you might be able to find him there in the jungle. And then she cackles with laughter, turned into a rainbow, and flew out the window. <laughs> So then he immediately resigned his tenure post. <laughs> and he went off into the jungle, stripped down to his doughty loincloth, you know, and marched off in the jungle muttering, oh, she might be his, his, his colleagues thought he was cracked, you know. 
but they didn't have him arrested like they would have in America and shot him full of Prozac. <laughs> so, so then he, he, he said he meets him till upon, he gets teaching and all kind of horrible things happen to him. He has 12 ordeals where every bone in his body is broken for different things. Tillipon assigns to him these different things to do, like terrible things. Like, he says, like, they're standing on the roof of some temple. He says, well, if I had a really good disciple, he would just jump off, you know. It's a, nowadays, everybody's an idiot. So then he jumps off, breaks every bone in his body, and then Tillipon comes down and says, what is, what's the matter with you? What, are you insane? Why are you doing that? And he said, and he's like this, you know, all bloody on the ground. And then Tilburg goes like, Shh, like this, and he's healed, you know. And did that, things like that to him 12 times. So the Dalai Lama joked, and he said, I have to be really careful in Dhamsala not to make any, like, casual statements, he said, because, you know, some of you Western hippies, somebody might, like, they might, like, jump off one of the terraces here in Dhamsala. <laughs> and he says, not only do I, I have not have the ability to heal them with the fast of my hands here in Dhamsala, but we don't even have ambulance service. <laughs> <laughs> so then, later, after he'd done some practice, and he was getting a little progress after he studied with Telepa, this Narapa guy, he meets this Vajrayogini, this red Dakini, you know, with like sort of slight fangs and red, bright red, stark naked hairdo, you know, carry thing. And he says, Oh, you must be the Vajrayogini. Thank goodness I have the vision of you. Now, please initiate me. And she says, oh, I don't think you can take it. You won't be initiated. He says, oh, Yeah, yeah, I do. She says, Okay. And she says, Come here. And then he becomes like miniature and he is drawn irresistibly into her mouth. And then he goes down through all, and then in the different chakras inside her body, he gets initiated. He has to go, he goes right down through her body, and I don't know how he comes out, I forgot. I, probably the navel, probably the, probably the yoni, I don't know how he comes yeah, out. But anyway, he comes out, he's all initiated. But he was, he was a little scared getting swallowed by the, by the yoni. So anyway, this is the beginning of the sadhana of her, how to practice her, and it has an opening verse. And he says, in the Namo, it starts with Namo Guru Vajra Dharmaya, this is, but you, you have that too, a Namo Guru there, I'm sure. In the mandala of supreme unsullied bliss, may glorious Heruka, Father, Mother, God, skilled connector of voidness and fabrications, sport forever ecstatic in my eternal drop. The eternal drop is the heart center, you know, in the center of the heart chakra. Right, the clear light, the, the soul drop, you could say. In the A realm, and that's also the syllable, A, you know, the, the, the word Evam is the male-female union, you know, A is the female, and Vam is the male. So Evam, which means thus, right, is the beginning of all Buddhist sutras, and all meanings are just in Evam, you know, so it's the idea. So in the A realm, that's the female, compassion, one taste, magic theater, her ecstatic beauty dance leads poor beings to the great bliss realm. May that accomplished artist, the Buddha Vajra Queen, protect us all forever. Did you translate that? Yeah. That's good. <laughs> but I didn't get extolled. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. What, try, what do you translate it as? What's artist? Huh? What do, you, what do you translate? I forgot. Artist. artist. Mm. But, uh, but, um, Artists, like. uh, you know, uh, uh, gar, you know uh, theater, because it's a theater thing, you know. So I think Garken or something like that made that accomplished artist, the Buddha Vajra Queen. But uh, it's, it has a meaning. I told you that about this Harvard colleague, um, for, for junior graduate student, and now, you know, what's her name? I forgot her name. Remember, she read my translation, called me up. It's surprisingly accurate. <laughs> I said, Janice, surprisingly? And she blushed red on the phone, and I could see the red through the thing. Because it because why? Because I love this stuff. And so, you know, I'm not too content to make it just some it has to be beautiful, because it is beautiful in the original language. Mm -hmm. So it, you have to find extol. <laughs> Or, or you're not doing a job. You know. But you know, the ordinary translators, the scholarly, the ones in, in, the, in, the, in the scholarship, they, the, why the translations are not very good, is because they're imprisoned in the concept that these are strange, superstitious, weird, pre-modern, 
people thinking odd things. Thinking metaphorically about. Right. And so they're kind of doing archaeology of like what could they have been thinking, sort of thing. They're thinking like that. So they don't they don't love it. You know? They don't. They think it's backward or something, underdeveloped. Yeah. Anyway, the Buddha Vajra Queen. Vajra, Vajra is an important concept. Vajra, that's another beautiful thing. Buddhist and Vedanta, the change of the word Vajra. Vajra in the Vedas was a thunderbolt held in the hand of Indra, a violent weapon, like a nuclear bomb that he threw at Vritra, the dragon, you know, to release the cattle and all this, you know. And it was a, it's a, it's a weapon. But in, um, it comes to be in a diamond, and, uh, and it means clear light of the void. And it means the energy of love and bliss comes to mean. Instead of violence and domination, it means love and bliss, you know, melting, powerful love and bliss, of emptiness. It's really, which is a nice, that's the whole Indian culture is like that. It's transvalued, that thing, you know, Buddhists and Vedists working together. Bhavani and the Vajra Yogini. Okay. People need to sleep, they need, need to get up to see John, can't hear John. <laughs> Campbell needs to get up. Yeah, what's your question? Will we get a copy of these translations? Sorry. Sure. Yeah. They're gonna Eventually. Print, they're going to print them. And yeah, I'm going to pick some pieces of this sadhana. In a way, to do this particular sadhana, and I'm... Maybe we could get a head, actually a head count. Okay, let me, let me read the next verse. Let's finish this first. Uh, it's a salutatory thing. To care for the fortunate in the 24 holy lands. That's one last thing I, we can talk about. They create, because it involves Shiva. They create various visions of uncertain transformations. May the field-born, mantra-born, and orgasmic dakinis. Dakini and yogini are the same, female Buddha, female enlightened being. May the field, and these are different types, field-born, mantra-born, and orgasmic dakinis keep us lovingly and grant our wished-for powers. A city, that is. Especially when we're caught in this darkened age, this best special short, uh, shortcut, very deep and fast, the springtime energy of the Tantra meaning ocean, the Dakini's heart essence nakedly revealed, May the highly fortunate take it as an ornament. That's nice. Okay. <laughs> Actually, we are highly fortunate to have all of you here at Menla. We are highly fortunate. We're going to um, email these. Uh, well, Michael will help us out and email uh, the texts to everyone. But is there uh, so if you're happy to read it on your device, or then you don't need a printout. But who knows that they will want? Could you just raise your hand if you would certainly like a printout? Because they will we'll print a little bit page by page. Oh, uh, okay, we'll go page. The by whole page. thing. So a little bit looks like about That's half. You have to come and twist Richard's arm to get the second verse. That's right. <laughs> I'm just gonna <laughs> print it out. Like, waste paper, bit by bit, baby steps. You know the great master Siddha of our culture, Bill Murray. <laughs> Baby steps. Baby steps. <laughs> How many of you here have seen What About Bob? <laughs> Yay! That's a Baby Steps precept. Gotcha. Okay, Richard? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we should all sleep well tonight. Yes. We have a sleep yoga at Medla also. <laughs> when you sleep, don't think you're going into a lack of materiality when you withdraw from your sense awarenesses, you know, where you're seeing things and hearing things and tasting and touching them. And that therefore, that when at the base of reality, there's a dark void, a nothingness. And that therefore, you're lying in nothingness unconsciously. Don't think that. There is a sense of becoming unconscious, and do that or you won't fall asleep. But then, you know what happens to you is the Bhavani, Shiva, and the Padra Yogini, you get in, you're in their lap. And then what is there is the clear light of the void. 
but it's called the clear light of the void. That is, underneath that layer of seeming darkness, there's a clear light or a transparency, which is Vajra and diamond, and there's an infinite energy. And that infinite energy, therefore, bathes you in abundance. It doesn't do anything to you because it's infinite, so therefore it, it's, it's quiescent. And yet, any piece of you that needs something draws from it without depleting it. And that's why you feel good in the morning when you wake up at 5 a.m. to go see John. And that's the sleep yoga here. You fall through unconsciousness into the clear light, the Vajra clear light of the void. Okay? And then that's when you're really going to feel well when you wake mm. up, therefore. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's Menla Sleep Yoga. That's, that's a nice. good one.